I'm very influenced by a philosopher named Martin Heidegger. And when you want to know about the times we're living in right now, it seems to me that he is the great philosopher of the 20th century because that, that that's what he that's not everything that he was interested in, but that's the last of the many things he was interested in. He wrote a book called The Question Concerning Technology. And technology is, for him, the way that we treat everything as resources, getting the most out of the, our, our possibilities. If you, I think if I, it works if you ask the students what is it that they really want out of life. Uh, they, some of them think maybe sort of happiness or pleasure or fun or something, but the most common answer is to get the most out of our possibilities. That's this thing of treating yourself as resources. The challenge of the 21st century is to come up with a new system, a new regime of assessment that takes collaboration seriously. The network experiment, to be successful, has got to include more than just the technology of getting computer A to talk to computer B. It's got to include the human institutions that will bring together these resources and people to solve real problems of real people. A new technological base for intellectual efforts. I think more people ought to get in there and think about the social process. That's what, that's what we are now, a time in which everybody wants to get the most out of their possibilities, every country, every person, and uh, so and that's very bad because that means that you don't really get deeply involved in anything. You stay at the level in which you can manipulate everything, you, you and other people too. Uh, and they're what they forget, it is a Kierkegaardian issue, really. I mean, Kierkegaard wrote a book or a long article called The Present Age, and that's when he introduced this notion of nihilism, that, that if you just try to maximize pleasure or try to be ethical, or try to be mystical, religious, you, you, you miss what's really important about human beings, that they should be totally committed to some particular thing. That's the only then can you be a self that isn't in despair, to talk in Kierkegaard way. And we are in this age now where people are not committed, don't think that that's a that's unfortunate. You're going to get. You're going to suffer. You are. Uh, and if you if you live that way, you don't find anything in your life that's really fully meaningful and satisfying. And Kierkegaard says that's the present age, and I think that's right. Uh, it is the mainly the view of the present age. Uh, I think that's what the students come into the course thinking. Maybe if I teach it well enough, and Kierkegaard is smart enough, which he certainly is, they come out understanding that they better be committed to something, 
And those are the ones who come up to me in the supermarket and say, I've changed their lives, of which there's more, many more than one would have thought. So for Kierkegaard, anyway, you get go through the sphere of existence, that is, you, the way of life of going for uh, keeping all possibilities open, and then you go from there to a way of life in which you obey the ethical principles and feel satisfied that you're doing the right thing, and then you go through this mystical sort of religious stage in which you try to feel that you're uh, one with the, what is the, in Dante, you're one with the love that moves the sun and the other stars. Uh, Kierkegaard has something like that. I forget what his is. But anyway, and then you get to this thing. You become totally committed to some political cause or to some person or to some idea that tells you who you are, gives you an identity. You are the lover of so-and-so or the leader of such a movement or whatever. I'm the iPod, the hero of uh, philosophy. So the question is, how is the way we learn through acting in the world different from the way we learn when we're reading a book or watching a play or the, or, uh, the TV or blogging back and forth in the, on, the, on, the, in, on the internet. Uh, how is it different? It's different because you're taking a risk. Uh, that's also got to do with what happens when you're teaching. I mean, you don't, you, if, you, if you're not already convinced you know the answer, and if you don't write out your lecture as a kind of finished thing that you give the students because you've got it and they haven't got it, then you're sort of out on your own and you don't know where you're going to end up. And sometimes you, when you're engaged in the world, you wonderful things happen for you and you're pulled into all kinds of interesting events and possibilities. That's how it happens when you're embodied and in, in, in touch with things. And that's totally different from when you're a kind of spectator uh, who's just uh, safely sitting at home or out in their book or like Descartes who went into a warm room and was free from emotions, he said, in order to write one of the most influential philosophy book ever, I suppose, Descartes' Meditations. Uh, so, so you either... Do, and, and Descartes was, in, if this story is right, a bad influence, a very bad influence, because his idea was that's what you should do, withdraw from the world and think and reflect and so forth. And you miss the positive thing you get if you're involved with the world and taking the risks. But I'm trying to ask myself, why is that a good thing to take these risks? Well, that's because you have to, if you believe that you need something to get you out of despair. And despair is this business of not ever having anything really important in your life, everything equally resources, which is the kind of world we're in. If it, then you, to get out of that kind of world, you've got to, Kierkegaard says, plunge in uh, to the stream and uh, struggle and swim. Uh, if, if, and if and only then do you live a life that's exciting, exciting and, and meaningful, and uh, only then do you know who you are, which is not the most important thing to know who you are, I don't think. It's to know, well, it depends on what you mean by that. If you mean know who you are, know what is crucially important to you, such that you can't give it up and still be you, that's, that's the most rewarding way to be. And that's it. Kierkegaard's the first to have said that, I believe. That that is that you have to jump in over your head twenty thousand swim over twenty thousand fathoms in the deep water if you're going to have a life worth living. This getting the body story together with the commitment story is so 
important. I guess I've, I'm, I'm learning right now from, from your question that I have never really seen that these two different views I hold don't immediately fit together. I'm sure they fit together, but it's not obvious to say that the, that the body is important and to say that commitment to some cause or to do science or to love somebody, all those are, that's what's important. If that's what's important, then it's not obvious that, you, that the body is all that important. It's funny, Kierkegaard doesn't have much to say about being embodied. Heidegger, my other hero, doesn't have, has only one sentence about having a body in his big fat book, Being in Time, the most important philosophy book of the 20th century, I think. And it, he says, well, it's somebody else's job to think about having a body. Uh, fascinating. So, so Merleau-Ponty does the job. And, he, and uh, somebody I think is very important that nobody else has ever heard of, named Samuel Todas, whose, whose thesis I think is so brilliant that I convinced MIT Press to publish it, and it is called The Human Body as the Material Subject of the World, and Todas is the one who was most thought out, the things that I've just been talking about, but he never actually wrote a book, but I took his thesis and got it published as a book. So anyway, nobody will see that book. And, but he, he is the, he's the one who tries to bring together having a body and having these uh, unconditional commitments. Perception is important. You, your body is what you use when you perceive things. Uh, you don't need your body when you're thinking about things. And, but perception is absolutely basic. Uh, but it's a different level. I mean, it isn't, I mean, everybody's got perception. They don't have, it, it isn't as each one having his own unconditional commitment. Uh, every, uh, and without a body, of course, you don't perceive objects and you don't get a grip on them. And, Having a grip on objects is very, very fundamental and important. That's Merleau-Ponty's sort of discovery. It's through a body we get what he calls an optimal or maximal grip on reality. You've got to show somehow that the way you perceive and are embodied and coping with things gives you a sense of what it is to have a grip on things as opposed to being outside sort of just looking in or looking at your computer or looking at the, uh, the scenery uh, and it's your body that en enables you to get a grip on things and when you've got a grip on on things you have among other things this sense of what's crucially important to you but how you get from your body grip and perception to the fact that there are things that are crucially important to you, I just don't know. There's so many things, that's, that's the point. That's why I'm so eager to teach in a way that I learn. Some smart student, some future totus in the audience, in the classroom, is gonna tell me very important, very valuable things. My co-author, Strawn Kelly, of course, is one of the main ones. My brother, I haven't talked about, yet, but I will, is certainly another one of the important ones. And there's so much to be understood that isn't understood that I'm just eager to hear what's going to come up next in my own course. Uh, that's, that's what's exciting. Well, that's interesting. Well, then we have to go back and think about what it is to disclose a new world. One of the things that will help us understand, perhaps, what this uh, relation to authentic running forward into death, what that could be like, is to ask about what, what people have when they have worlds. 
animals don't have worlds. They, Heidegger says animals are world poor, but we have world, a world, each of us, and there's a shared world too uh, that we all have, and and creative people can disclose new worlds. Heidegger thinks, and I think that's right, and. Uh, it's hard to understand what it is to be a creative person and disclose new worlds, but it's got to do with having a t completely new take on something important that people have all gotten wrong and which you have this kind of moment of aha if you get it right. And you can, I can think, let me exa one kind of example of that, which I've been interested in, there's some sense in which Steve Jobs is disclosing new worlds when he opens up the idea of the iPhone and, and the iPad and the movie, the di digital movies, uh, the, what do you call the thing that he's, Pixar, the, the movies. And, I mean, he's invented about five totally new just different ways of having a world and having activities and that's pretty amazing uh, and that's that's what it would be like in a localish way to disclose new worlds but there are big deal ways to disclose new worlds when, so people talk about Einstein or they talk about uh, uh, Descartes for instance though in a certain way he's a bad guy <laughs> in a certain way he's a big big deal discloser of modernity. It's just the modernity may not be such a nice thing to disclose. But so, so what am I saying? That you need to know about what it is to disclose worlds in order to understand what it is to lose worlds too. It's true that to disclose a world, you've got to give up the previous one that was a, some kind of misunderstanding. When I was something like discovering a world, and that's different than my brother. We each did it, but in a diff different disclosing of a different world. So uh, with me I, I, at MIT, I came to MIT to teach at just the time when everybody was interested in computers and believed that we would soon have artificial intelligence where computers would be as smarter, smarter than we are, and so forth. And they made movies about it and they made speeches about it and they thought they were the leaders of the discovery of the new world but they weren't they were exactly making the mistakes of all the traditional philosophers from uh, Descartes on that believing that you're in a world when you can step back and reflect and disconnect and contemplate and so forth so my relation to MIT was to, complete, to totally criticize what they were saying and say, no, that's not how people are. And I get back to Kierkegaard, people are capable of unconditional commitments to define them. Nobody's going to ever have that in a level of artificial intelligence. Computers don't have, that aren't self-defined individuals and they never will be, even if they learn to play Jeopardy and become world chess champions. That's not the same as being a human being. So, and I, I was sort of surprised at this con conclusion. Well, what, what, no, that's not the way to put it. I was drawn into the debate between whether there ever would be artificial intelligence the way they were trying to get it at MIT. Who knows what there could ever be, but the way they were going about at MIT, trying to make artificial intelligence, I said, they'll never be able to do it. And they tried to fire me at MIT for giving false uh, plausibility to my stupid remarks by the fact that I make them as a professor at MIT. And uh, my book on the subject, What Computers Can't Do, got read by experts all over the world. And finally, the president of MIT called me in and said, no, they're not going to fire me. They're going to keep me. And, they, and that was all 
interesting. It was interesting mainly because people say, boy, you were so courageous to fight against the people who could fire you at MIT and so forth. And I want to say, no, I wasn't courageous at all because I didn't say to myself, this is risky, but I have to do it. I just was outraged that they were sort of lying to themselves and to the general public about things that they didn't understand and telling people that in eight or ten years they're going to be computers more intelligent than me. That just seemed to me so utterly wrong thing to believe and wrong to go around telling every people and giving con constant interviews about it. And so I couldn't resist, this is the important thing, putting my career on the line to say no this is wrong and to become identified with this book what computers can't do and my next book what computers still can't do and to take take the risk of being kicked out of MIT and so forth the important thing is what's what it is to be courageous is to be open to be drawn into something that you're committed to even if it's risky I mean that's what happened to me with computers and in artificial intelligence. I was drawn into something completely risky. My job, oh, I almost lost my job and uh, and I put all my energy into books that said they were wrong and tried to give reasons why they were wrong and that that's that's not correct. Well that that's what really happens I think. I mean I don't think for a minute there it was anything about courage. There was there was something about not wanting to be lied to. That was for me a big surprise that that you could get into this kind of risky situation, and that it was really very rewarding, even if you turned out to be wrong and lost your job. At, at, at MIT, they had a meeting every year where there were about five hundred students, and where they got me debating the other the AI people in front of those students and more and more I think I won over some followers. But everybody gets to be, if they're hard working and take risks and so forth, uh, a, an, an expert at something or a master if you really want to go all the way. and. And it's something that, since everybody has had this experience, it's odd that philosophers uh, never explain the experience. And worse, they totally mis-explained it. That's why they misunderstood uh, the computers and thought they could be intelligent. They thought being intelligent was having the right rules in your mind and the right descriptions in your mind. And in fact, it wasn't like that at all. And then he has it. The first stage, it's true, you need rules. I'll, I'll give an example from chess and from driving. Chess is very disembodied, I think. Driving is obviously very embodied. Both of them equally have this same five or six stage structure. I say six because my brother doesn't like this stage. He stopped, his work stopped at this stage. And master is really like world disclosure. It's so he like being a mathematician. He doesn't like something that's not very clear. Uh, so that back here, all this thinking is going to get in your way. Even here, the your the, your thinking isn't going to be the way an expert thinks. An expert doesn't think. He just does what works and you know, which, what, what has normally worked for him, and it will normally work. And uh, so in chess, the, 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 a master chess player or an expert chess player just can make within a few seconds a high-level move. And uh, it's, and that's, that's what's exciting about expertise. And in, in driving, you just automatically your foot comes up from the gas or goes on the brake. And uh, if you start thinking about why you should do this or when you should do this, you stop doing it well. That's that kind of thoughtful reflection is in, is in the way of expertise. Now that's important because that's 
what I consider sort of the breakthrough. I mean, for th three, 300 years at least, which is the, how long it's been since Descartes, or maybe even for a thousand years, philosophers have thought that the more thinking you do, the more an analysis you do, the better the performance will be. And what Stuart just contemplating driving in chess, two things he knows how to do, like an expert, saw that that's extreme, extremely wrong. All this thinking about what to do and memorizing what to do is getting in the way of the spontaneous doing. Of course, you can't just be, start that way. You've got to have lots of experience, take risks, lose some time, win some time. But if you do all that and you do it every all a lot, then you can get to the point where you don't think anymore. And then you're really good. Then you're, you're that's what the chess uh, expert does. He just sees with, with the right move and makes it. You can make it, you, you can play blitz chess if you're a master, which means you can make a, a move in about three seconds or something after you see the previous move, and you'll still be playing at master level, and you won't be thinking at all. So there's something higher, namely intuition, that you have to have, which is leading you to see the situation in such a way that it draws you immediately to do the appropriate thing. And then there's something harder to describe, which my brother, this is, this is the revelation, that philosophers have been 180 degrees wrong for the history of whole history of philosophy, thinking that rules and facts and reflection was the way to become ex intelligent and expert. All, all you needed to do is just pay attention to your own experience. The reason Stuart could do it is he's never read a philosophy book in his life at that point. He maybe has read some since. He was a mathematician, an applied mathematician. He, he had to just look at what he was doing when he was driving and what he was doing when he was playing expert level chess. And he did, and he saw this, and it changed it didn't change the whole world, but it did change a lot of the way people learned a lot of skills that are now sort of devoted to repeating his views about these things. And it sort of turned the idea about how the mind works when you're an expert upside down. And that, to me, from inside philosophy was a big revelation. And then I realized that, that Heidegger was on to that. Heidegger talks about how you, when you, you have to become skilled in, in dealing with the world, and when you are, you're absorbed. That's his word. You're absorbed in the situation. So if you're a carpenter, you could be an expert carpenter. But if you're really, really a good carpenter, you, you, you will just, the, the hammer withdraws, Heidegger says. The hammer uh, disappears, and you sort of disappear, in, into this activity. And that's, we are the kind of being that's absorbed, that can be absorbed in what they're doing. And when they are, it brings them out at their best. That's, that's the moral of this skill story.